Hey, what's up friends? This is a four part video series where I'm going to teach my way verse by verse and just stopping and making observations through Matthew chapter 24. So this video is part one of that and um, I'm going to title the message or this video Braxton Hicks and I will talk about why I'm uh, naming the message that later in the video, probably, unless I forget. Um, but in this video, um, we're just going to go through Matthew chapter 24, verse 1, Stop, and we're going to stop in verse 8. But actually, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 23 for context sake. So let's go ahead and do that. So starting in verse 37 of Matthew chapter 23, this is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. The Jewish religious leaders and of course his disciples are there with him to hear what Jesus is telling the Pharisees verse 37 O Jerusalem Jerusalem you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you are not willing okay let me stop there so we see that Jerusalem has prophetic significance and that Jerusalem, this, the, the land and the people of Jerusalem, um, have God's heart. God holds uh, Jerusalem near and dear to his heart. He has a love for the, the people and the land of Jerusalem in spite of the fact that they killed and stoned the prophets and those sent to them. So God has sent prophets to Jerusalem because he loves Jerusalem but they rejected them and essentially rejected God and, and God's voice what he was trying to say to them through the prophets they stoned them they killed them and in spite of this even though they killed and stoned the prophets Jesus is still saying how I've longed to gather you together gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings so um, that's noteworthy. Verse 38. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Okay, let me stop there. So when Jesus says house here in this verse, he's talking about the temple of God. Um, remember how uh, Jesus in his, the last week of his life here on earth, when he's in uh, the temple courts teaching, um, he says, my father's house uh, is supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations. And of course, he's talking about the temple of God. So Jesus is doing the same thing here. He's talking about the temple of God when he says, your house, to the Pharisees. And he says, your house is left to you desolate. So this is crazy, because desolate means destroyed, ruined, abandoned, deserted. When you hear the word desolate, think of a barren wasteland. It's deserted. So something crazy has to happen in order for, um, you know, something to be left desolate, right? Like uh, an invading nation or an army coming against the city of Jerusalem and besieging it. And when, when Jesus says this, he's putting his feet in the shoes of former prophets, from prophet, of prophets of old. And like Jeremiah, for example, uh, Jeremiah was trying to tell the people of Judah that there's going to be an evading, invading nation coming um, to punish them if they don't repent, right? The, the nation of Babylon. The Babylonians were going to come and it was going to be God's tool of punishment on the people of Judah and Jerusalem for their unfaithfulness, their idolatry, and their wickedness um, that they were unwilling to repent of. And this is God being faithful to his word and to his promises because he promised to bless uh, the people of Israel if they obeyed his commandments. And then he also promised to curse them uh, if they disobeyed. And that is in the Mosaic Covenant, right? The Law of Moses. Uh, in the first five books of the Bible, uh, the Torah, we see... Um, the Mosaic Covenant that uses language like if and then. So if you obey, then you will be blessed. Uh, I will send rain so that you can have plenty of harvest. You know, I'll make sure everything, 
everything grows, you'll be prosperous, your, your fruit of the vine, the cattle, you know, just the land and everything will be blessed if you obey. So if you obey my commandments, then you will be blessed. But if you disobey, then I will kick you out the land. You'll be exiled and I will bring sword and famine against you. So that's what's going on here. Jesus is saying that um, to the Pharisees. And then uh, I actually want to um, cross-reference this verse and read uh, two other verses just so we can kind of um, see, see that. And so I already talked about Jeremiah, so I'm going to read Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 5. But if you do not obey these commands, declares the Lord, I swear by myself that this place will become a ruin. And I believe he's talking about the temple in this context, but I'm not sure. So go and read it yourself. I'm not sure. And then I want to read uh, 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 5 through 9. And I know for sure that God is talking about the temple. It, it will be clearer when I read this passage. So this is when the Lord appears to Solomon after Solomon um, prays and dedicates uh, the temple to God. So Solomon builds the temple and then he prays and dedicates it to God and then the Lord appears and this is what he says starting in verse 5. I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever as I promised David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons turn away from me, you see there's the if language, but if you or your sons turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then, there's that then language, I will cut off Israel from the land. I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel then will become a byword and an object of ridicule among all people. And though this temple now imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this people? Oh, and to this temple, excuse me. Verse 9. People will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. So that's kind of what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here in Matthew 23, verse 38. Now I'm going to read verse 39. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And if you're thinking that this is a reference to the triumphal entry, when Jesus is riding the donkey into Jerusalem, and everyone is um, saying Hosanna in the highest and praising him. This is not referring to that because the triumphal entry has already happened. It has already taken place. Because I believe that when Jesus is saying this to the Pharisees here, this is like um, a day before the Last Supper. And then you know what happens after that. He gets arrested and crucified. Um, so it's not a reference to that. Um, so Jesus is saying, For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's important as we move forward um, into Matthew 24. All right, so uh, after Jesus says this to the Pharisees, his disciples with him, then he leaves the temple courts, and then he um, walks away from the temple and is headed towards uh, the Mount of Olives. So verse 1 of Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Verse 2. Do you see all these things? He asked. So Jesus asked them. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. All right, so what's going on here? So the disciples just heard Jesus say this crazy statement, right? He, he just heard Jesus tell the Pharisees, look, your house is left to you desolate. Pretty much saying that the temple of, this temple of God is going to be destroyed. And mind you, this is the second temple. This isn't the temple uh, that Solomon built because that was destroyed by the Babylonians. 
This is uh, the second temple that um, the Israelites uh, with Nehemiah built. Okay, and um, so they they heard Jesus say that, and they're like, "What? Th this is crazy! Surely, you know, the second temple of God is not going to be destroyed again." So they heard Jesus say that, and they're trying to um, ask him about this, but they don't really know how to go about doing it. And Jesus knows their intention, knows where um, they're headed with this, just moves it along um, himself because they're, you know, trying to ask him awkwardly, like they're trying to draw his attention to the temple. And then he just says, look, look at the temple. You know, you see all these things? I tell you the truth. It's, it, you know, it's going to be destroyed. All right. Verse three. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately tell us they said when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age all right so this verse right here verse 3 is huge I will probably in each part in each video um, of this series will read this verse or at least remind us of this verse because it is the context for Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25 because the disciples heard Jesus say blessed or you won't see me again until you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and so now they're asking him right Jesus is probably sitting on a tree stump um, on the Mount of Olives and they're able to see um, the temple and they ask him three questions essentially a what, when, and a when. Because they just heard him say, look, your house will be left to you desolate. And they say, when will this happen? So they ask him when, what, and what. They ask him, when will, when will these things happen? When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? Because they just heard him say, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they ask him, and what will be a sign of the end of the age? Now I'm assuming that the disciples knew that the two were connected. They probably gleaned that from all the, old pro uh, all the prophets in the Old Testament. Um, you know, because every time they talked about the coming kingdom of the Messiah, it was, um, you know, in correlation with the end of the age. So I'm assuming um, that they knew that the second coming of or the coming of the Messiah and the establishment of his kingdom was connected with the end of the age. And even if they didn't know that the two were connected, they still ask him. They still say, what is a sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And now for the rest of Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Jesus is answering these questions. He's answering their question. Okay, so verse 4, Jesus answered, and isn't that beautiful? That's such an encouraging truth uh, that we should be reminded of. That when we ask Jesus questions, he answers. Look at that right there in verse 4. Jesus answered. And so from verse 4 until verse 8, where I'm going to stop, these are what Jesus calls, as we'll see when we get to verse 8, the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus answered, verse 4, Watch out that no one deceives you. Let me stop there. So, if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, um, then Jesus is putting the responsibility on you to not be deceived. Uh, he's putting the responsibility on you and I to not be deceived because he didn't say, uh, watch out, um, there's going to be a lot of deception at the end of the age, but don't worry because I will protect your mind and make sure that you're not deceived. Um, he doesn't say that. He says, watch out, you know, make sure that no one deceives you. You know, be on your guard. Um, love the truth. Know the truth. Believe the truth so that you won't believe the lies. You got to be discerning and wise enough to be able to discern between lies and truth and good and evil so you watch out but of course Jesus is there to give us wisdom and discernment and to help us but look he's doing his part 
now or I mean he he already did his part he's telling us in advance that there's going to be deception rampant at the end of the age that false prophets are going to rise up to deceive many so we need to be on our guard and watch out so that no one deceives us he's letting us know ahead of time um, so now it's on us that we actually obey his commandments to watch out to be on guard and not let anyone deceive us okay so verse 4 Jesus answered watch out that no one deceives you verse 5 for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many so there's going to be many that come and many that are deceived many that come claiming that they're the Christ and now the word Christ means Messiah Messiah means anointed one so how many times have you heard you know on a Sunday morning from the pulpit maybe there's a guest speaker or something say something along the lines of I can sense the anointing or the anointing is thick and heavy in this place right now or the anointing is on me or whatever you know how many times have, have you heard uh, you know a uh, speaker say that and of course they're coming in the name of Jesus right um, so what Jesus is letting us know here is that there's going to be deception within Christianity within the church so this is in-house deception that we have to look out for that we have to watch out to not be deceived by fellow Christians those claiming to be anointed and those coming in the name of Jesus right so that's that's sobering right there but um, I don't think uh, I have to tell you that that um, you know exists today that there's deception within Christianity there's lots of false teachers and false prophets uh, you know coming in the name of Jesus okay verse 6 you will hear of wars and rumors of wars but see to it that you are not alarmed such things must happen but the end is still to come so why is Jesus saying but the end is still to come let me remind you because he's answering their question they asked what will be a sign of your coming and a sign of the end of the age and so he's saying you're gonna hear of wars and rumors of wars but don't be alarmed because these things must happen but the end is still to come okay um, and when he says that these things or such things must happen um, it pretty much he's it, what he means is in order to get to where we're going which is the end of the age because um, you know God is telling a story it started in the Garden of Eden that was the beginning and there's an end to this story and that's where we're headed there's going to be a climax and a culmination of all this and that is going to be when Jesus cracks the heavens open and returns to earth as king and restores everything and makes everything new so that's the story um, the end of the story where we're headed but before we get there as we're gonna see um, Jesus tells us you know that there's going to be great distress great tribulation um, in fact it's going to be the greatest tribulation that has ever been in human history um, because tribulation isn't something new it's actually a part it's it's actually a normal part of the human experience if you look throughout human history there's always been um, tribulations all kinds of different tribulations in the world in different parts of the world throughout human history from the very beginning there's been troubles and, and calamities and atrocities and just you know various types of tribulation and I and what Jesus is telling us here that what makes this last final tribulation different than the rest besides the severity of it how bad it's going to be um, is that all these signs are going to be consecutive they're going to be back to back because we've seen wars before right we've heard rumors of wars and deception has always existed inside of the church and Christianity right but what he's telling us here is these things are going to be um, back to back um, and you know it's going to be clumped together 
Uh, so watch out for that. When all of this is unfolding and taking place, when it's like a domino and ch -ch -ch -ch, they're just all falling, all of this is happening at once. Um, so when he says these things must happen, it just means in order to get to where we're going, the end of the story, we have to go through a dark night. There's going to be an hour in human history on earth that's going to be terrible. Just like in order to for a pregnant woman to get to uh, delivery and the birth of her new baby, she has to go through labor. She has to go through the pain um, of labor, right? But um, she will still, you know, end up at the end. So that's, that's what Jesus is saying when he says these things must happen. Okay, verse 7. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And what's interesting is that in Luke chapter 21, when Luke is um, telling this, when he's given his account of Jesus answering the disciples' questions uh, of what is a sign at the end of the age, uh, Jesus actually says there will be pestilences, which is like diseases and sickness, right? And I mean, I don't have to tell you, but we just lived through, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic. Um, so that's interesting, right? I mean, I'll go ahead and say it. I actually believe that we are at the beginning of the beginning of birth pains, that we are approaching the, the beginning of birth pains, the early pains of labor. Um, and verse 7, it says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom of, against kingdom. So, of course, that is like, you know, the nation, just to use it as an example, uh, that's like the nation of Russia going against the nation of Ukraine. But I believe, I'm not entirely sure, in the original language, uh, it also gives us an idea that it's people rising against people, like when it says kingdom against kingdom, it's not just this kingdom rising against this kingdom, but actually the kingdom rising against itself being divided. And I don't have to tell you that there's lots of polarization going on, especially here in the West, and there's lots of division here in America. So that's kind of crazy. That's interesting. Um, and then verse 8, Jesus says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. And so the reason why I remembered, the reason why I'm calling this Braxton Hicks is because what Braxton Hicks is, is uh, early labor pains. When a woman is pregnant, she will experience the pain of contraction, contractions and labor, but that doesn't mean she's in labor yet. It's just her body practicing and preparing for labor. And that can happen to pregnant women as early as the second trimester, I believe. Um, but usually, it's, it's, it more commonly happens before she actually goes into labor, the pregnant woman. Usually happens towards the end, uh, you know, in the third trimester, right before she goes into labor, that the body will have these um, labor pains, and contractions that aren't actually her going into labor. And Braxton Hicks is a term that was coined way later than this time. And I believe that maybe if the term Braxton Hicks was coined back in Jesus' day, then maybe Jesus would have said, and all these are just Braxton Hicks, right? But he says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. So that's what he means, like the early uh, pains of labor. So verses four through eight, Everything that he listed and described there is just early labor pains. It's the beginning of birth pains. 